I'm going to start with a story. It's a story that we've all been involved with, along with every other form of life on this planet for billions of years. And it's the story of how thorium has sustained and nurtured life on this earth. The thorium within our planet, along with uranium and potassium, releases heat that keeps our Earth's core molten, which helps generate the magnetic field through a complex process that many engineers and scientists have tried to explain to me, and I still don't understand. But I'm glad it's there because, as an old NASA guy, it does this important role of deflecting the solar wind, which would otherwise strip our atmosphere off. We don't like that. It also helps generate the heat that drives volcanism, which leads to plate tectonics and the recycling of carbon in the earth. And so we get to enjoy this lovely, green, fertile, inhabitable planet thanks to the, the blessings of thorium. And I, I tell this story to people and sometimes they can scarcely believe it, but it is an amazing story. And I appreciate Kim Johnson who helped turn me on to what thorium has done to sustain our planet. This gift from the stars, even after doing all this, is now potentially ready to help us in our moment of crisis, because this is the human race right now. We are in a precarious situation. The energy that sustains our marvelous industrial civilization, and we can gaze out the windows and we can see what access to abundant and significant sources of energy can do for a civilization. We live a lifestyle. We have a, a standard of living. We have the ability to travel, to eat, to sleep to uh, be kept safe from the elements. We live a lifestyle that no people in history has ever even approached, and we have it because of our access to energy. But our access to energy has risks attached to it going forward in the future. If we want to have an industrial society, we can't continue to base it almost entirely on the use of fossil fuels. Uh, not only the risk of fossil fuel depletion, but also the risk to the environment uh, due to the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, due to pollution, spreading of mercury from burning coal. This isn't a sustainable, this isn't a sustainable solution. It's not a sustainable way of living. And just looking at the scale of what we do with fossil fuels, natural gas, coal, uh, oil, the pollution associated with it, the risks to global climate change, we, in, we sense intuitively that this is not a way that we can continue to go forward. There's a lot of people who think that this is the answer, that it's going to be natural energy flows like wind and, and solar power. Those energy flows are conceptually very attractive because they seem infinite, they seem abundant, and indeed on the scale of human existence, they, they are essentially infinite. But they're intermittent and they're also very diffuse. They do not have the ability to concentrate energy production in a small volume like more dense forms of energy do. The inevitable conclusion of using a diffuse and, and occasionally intermittent power source, uh, particularly with solar, is you know, the sun goes down every night and, and you're forced to turn to energy storage, which is expensive and difficult. So people like us think about the energies of the atom because the energies of the atom are so much greater than the energies of, of rearranging chemical bonds, of, of chemistry. To access the energy in the nucleus offers a million times the potential of accessing the energy of, of the electrons. But stuff like this is often thrown in our face and, and possibly for good reason too. Uh, I got my issue of The Economist the other day and, and there they were telling me that what I'm working on is the dream that failed. And, uh, <laughs> I, I really wanted to craft a letter to the editor right then. And it's funny because I've, I've actually been in The Economist uh, before, so I, I kind of wish they would have uh, maybe interviewed uh, one of us about this, although they did make favorable mention of thorium and molten salt in the articles that were part of this, this sequence. But a lot of people have read this, and they've talked to me, and they've said, you know, Kirk, why is a, a magazine like The Economist saying nuclear power is the dream that failed? Is that true? Because a lot of people seem to think it. My rebuttal to that, as I say, there are some inescapable truths about nuclear energy that are not subject to public opinion. And if we do turn away from nuclear energy, we're still going to be facing these inescapable truths. One of them is nuclear fuels have a million times the energy potential of fossil fuels. That is simply a truth. The other one is nuclear power 
does not emit carbon dioxide and it can operate without oxygen. It's not based on combustion. We have some uh, submarine officers in the room with us who can attest to the ability of nuclear power to operate underwater without oxygen for a very, very long periods of time. In my time at NASA, that was a particular interest to us because uh, uh, you, you're not able to employ combustion when you're in space. I really think that there are three basic uh, keys that we've got to get into the public's mind if we are to realize a new era of thorium energy. And the first one is that liquid fuel is a superior approach to nuclear energy than solid fuel. And feeding off of that realization is the thorium fuel cycle, which is uniquely enabled in liquid fuel, offers more potential for the long run than the uranium fuel cycle. I think this has been missed for many decades because the focus has been the use of solid fuel and thorium does not perform particularly well in solid fuel. It's, it's a marginal improvement, but not radical. And then this third one, which has been a, a realization that has been somewhat slow in coming to me as well, which is that the most useful things that these machines might produce might not even be electricity. It may be other things, and I'm, I'm becoming more and more convinced that medicines and, and desalinated water and process heat are going to end up being more valuable products from the use of liquid fluoride thorium reactors than electricity, that electricity may end up being a secondary product. We spend a, a great deal of effort in the fabrication of solid nuclear fuel. My colleague, Kirk Dorius, his father-in-law is an expert in the fabrication of uh, zirconium cladding for nuclear fuels, and he spent some time with us recently, and, and I really got an appreciation for <laughs> just what a tenuous material that, which is just one part of how we make nuclear fuel is. Uh, we begin by making these uranium oxide pellets and we form them into fuel rods uh, clad in this zirconium. Turns out the zirconium in certain conditions can be quite reactive with the water that's surrounding the reactor. But the part I kept coming back to in discussion was we have a fuel and a coolant that are inherently incompatible with one another. And that's how we run nuclear today. And there's a risk there. There's a very real risk. And it was realized at uh, Fukushima Daiichi when uh, hydrogen gas was generated from the reaction with zirconium and water and led to a very visible explosion, several of them in fact, that resonate in the public's minds. You know, they said, what about the explosion? I said, you mean the hydrogen gas explosion? Yeah. People just saw an explosion, they heard nuclear, oh, that's bad. But it's expensive to make nuclear fuel and I don't like the way we do it. It costs too much and it, and it works too poorly. We're only using a small amount of the potential energy in the nuclear fuel and there's a number of reasons for that. One of which is any nuclear fission is going to make gaseous fission products, xenon and krypton, other products. But xenon and krypton are significant because they have, as gases, they have a huge amount of volume per unit mass. And that leads to cracks and distortions and swelling in the fuel. When the fuel swells to a certain point, the clad can't hold it anymore. And when the clad can't hold it anymore, it's time to remove the fuel from the reactor. At this point, only a small amount of the energy has been consumed. But even if we had a fuel that was impervious to radiation damage, in uranium fuel, you're only able to burn up a small fraction because you cannot breed uranium to plutonium in the thermal spectrum. You cannot breed that sustainably. You can't achieve a conversion ratio of one. Thus, the interest traditionally in fast spectrum reactors for uranium. But with liquid fuel, we can address most of these concerns. Fundamentally, because the liquid fuel is ionically bonded, not covalently bonded, so it is impervious to radiation damage. It will not be altered in its properties by the withering radiation environment inside the reactor. It has a wonderful liquid range of about 1,000 degrees C. You have to get it to a certain temperature before it will melt, but once you get it to that point, it will stay liquid for a tremendous range. Contrast that with water, which is what we use which only has 100 degrees C of liquid range at standard pressure. We increase that liquid range by putting it under tremendous pressures, but therein is, is a risk that, that I'll, that I'll uh, cover in just a moment. And into these liquid fuels, we can dissolve the fuels of the thorium fuel cycle or the uranium fuel cycle, but we can put the uranium and the thorium in a true solution in these nuclear fuels, and as many of you know, uh, lithium fluoride, beryllium fluoride, if you rearrange the letters, you get this funny word called FLYB the, that we took as our, our funny name of our company. One of my favorite things, though, about the liquid fuel form is 
this safety feature that is inherently, uh, it, is, it is unique to liquid fuel and standard operating at atmospheric pressure. The ability to drain the reactor into a passively safe configuration without operator intervention, without uh, anything active or mechanical or computer-based needing to take place. The, the notion of having a small port at the bottom of the reactor that is kept blocked by a frozen plug of salt, that when power is lost, the reactor will drain itself passively into a configuration where decay heat can be rejected to the environment. This is such a remarkable feature, and it really is unique to having this liquid fuel form and to having something that can operate at standard pressure. You can't do this in solid fuel. If you do this in solid fuel, it's called a meltdown. That's bad. For us, it's, it's no problem. But this has been, to my experience, one of the key ways that we've reached out to the public is we're able to show them, here's the simple and safe way this reactor is not going to harm you. Because the public is worried about, am I going to be harmed by the use of nuclear power? We've got to show them that within this approach, there is an opportunity to drastically reduce that risk. I can only contrast this with what happened uh, in a solid fuel reactor at Fukushima as, as coolant levels drained in the reactor, these ceramic fuel rods were not being cooled uh, nearly as effectively as they were with the liquid water. Uh, gas is a much poorer coolant than, than liquid. And without that removal of heat, the, the rods melted, they failed, and, and you had a radiation release. And then that's, that's not good. We don't want that. The entire Pressurized water reactor, as we know, operates under tremendous pressure, whether in the boiling water mode or, or in the pressurized water mode. Uh, that leads to every system needing to be of a very high quality, of a very high grade, because every penetration or valve or way for pressure to be released in this reactor is critical. It's safety critical. Uh, the loss of pressure can potentially lead to a meltdown. All of our safety systems in existing reactors are built to mitigate this. And I'm very impressed with how the nuclear industry has operated safely for so long. But it comes with great complexity, great carefulness, and great cost. And if we want to move into a world where nuclear is far more prevalent, safer, and cheaper, we've got to change these fundamental principles, and we've got to move away from high pressure operation. That will also free us from having to build very, very large containment buildings. We can build containment buildings that are more close fitting to the reactor. They're cheaper, they're smaller. We can build them in a factory. Uh, I, I talk to people about modular construction, which is certainly one of our goals. Lots of people are talking about small modular reactors and factory construction. And I think, well, how do you do this when you've got to build a big pressure vessel? I mean, I know it's possible, but it's challenging. This is a way to make it a lot less challenging by using a non-pressurized fluid. So here's the basis of the lifter that we're working on at Flybe Energy. It's got a fuel salt, which contains uranium-233. It flows through graphite moderator elements. It's heated by fission, and it heats a coolant salt in the primary heat exchanger. All of this is contained inside a containment boundary. Then that coolant salt exits the containment boundary and heats a gas, uh, probably nitrogen or helium, which in turn drives a gas turbine. Due to the temperatures at which the reactor is operating, it's possible to achieve higher efficiencies, higher thermal efficiencies with this configuration because the reactor is fundamentally delivering heat at a higher temperature. With our water-cooled reactors, we can convert heat to electricity at about 35% efficiency. With salt and gas turbines, we could potentially go a lot higher, uh, 45, coming up close to 50%. That's really an impressive uh, improvement in, in thermal efficiency performance. But one of the things that really excites me is this back end. So you, you spin the turbine, you make uh, electricity, the electricity goes out on the grid, but then you cool the gas from the turbine, and there's still a lot of heat energy in that gas. In thermodynamics, we call it enthalpy. Uh, still a lot of enthalpy in that gas, and that enthalpy can then be used to desalinate seawater using just waste heat. This is something 
that a water-cooled steam turbine reactor can't do because it has to cool its steam at a very low temperature in order to achieve attractive efficiency. They can use electricity to drive reverse osmosis or other processes, but that's a penalty. That's electricity you didn't sell to a customer or didn't use or shaft power that didn't go do work for you on, on, the, on the grid or spinning a propeller or whatever it is. This is energy that would otherwise go to waste that we can use productively in the gas turbine to desalinate uh, seawater. Just visiting the, the potential coolants that reactors can use. I mean, I like to try to boil down a space. I go, okay, what's everything that could be done in nuclear reactors? And I know there's a few others, but I think this really captures the majority of the coolants that have been considered. Uh, water is the one most commonly used. It operates at relatively low temperatures and very high pressures. That's exactly what we don't want. We want to operate at low pressures and at high temperatures in order to achieve high thermal efficiency. Gas can operate at high temperatures, but it has to go to high pressure. Only the salts appear to offer the potential to go to the high temperatures and at the low pressures. And that's a unique combination in the, in the potential space of nuclear coolants. Now let's talk a minute about thorium as a fuel and how thorium is enabled by the liquid fuel approach. Thorium's only got one isotope and a very long half-life. It's much more common than natural uranium. And if you think about all we're consuming now is that very, very, very small sliver of natural uranium that is uranium-235. That's what we're using up. And we're not accessing the much larger amounts of uranium. We need a fast reactor to do that. On the other hand, with thorium, we can access the energies of thorium in a thermal spectrum reactor. And thermal spectrums are much simpler, safer reactors to build. With the thorium approach, we absorb a neutron, causing thorium to decay through a chain to uranium-233, which is the fuel. The absorption of another neutron leads to a fission in uranium-233 that releases more than two neutrons. And that's very significant, because you need more than two neutrons, one to continue the fission reaction, and the other to continue the conversion of thorium into new fuel. The physical mechanisms by which we are working on uh, to, to make this take place have to do with what we call a two-fluid reactor. And in this design, you have a fuel salt which contains uranium-233. This is a flibe salt with uranium. And as it passes through the reactor, it undergoes fission. About half of those neutrons are absorbed in the fuel salt, and the other half are absorbed in what we call a blanket. Now, this is not what the core looks like. This is just a cartoon. But uh, the, the blanket contains thorium, and the thorium's main job is to become new fuel. So as thorium turns into uranium, it is extracted from the blanket through a very simple process called fluoride volatility. This will extract uranium preferentially and not thorium. Uranium has the ability to go from one valence state, uranium tetrafluoride, to uranium hexafluoride, which is a gas. So it will just come out like bubbles from cola drink. It will come out as uranium hexafluoride. In order to fuel the core salt, you contact that uranium hexafluoride gas with a little bit of hydrogen gas and some of this fuel salt, and that hydrogen will remove two of the fluoride ions, and it will reduce UF6 back to UF4, which will be in solution. So you're continuously refueling the core while the core is continuously regenerating new fuel in the blanket. The resultant products of this uh, hydrofluoric, anhydrous hydrofluoric acid, can then be electrolyzed in an electrolyzer, which regenerates both the fluorine and the hydrogen. So this is a closed cycle process that regenerates its reactants. What we need to do to keep the machine running, we need to continually add new thorium to the blanket. So it's basically burning thorium uh, by turning it first into uranium-233 and then, and then into fission. And we haven't ascertained yet, won't be able to until we have some better depletion calculations, how often we will need to process the core salt. And its processing is, is very much similar, both fluoride volatility, hexafluoride distillation, and reduction, those are just repeats of these processes over here. So there's a little bit of a different approach that you do for the core because you're processing on a different schedule. But uh, all of these industrial processes, they're radiation hard. They don't require the fuel to be aged or, or stored for some period of time. And that's a real contrast with how people talk about doing existing nuclear fuel processing today. The power of thorium in a liquid fluoride thorium reactor, if used at these kinds of efficiencies, becomes really mind-boggling. And to try to put this in perspective, I commissioned this animation 
uh, the notion of a single cubic meter of regular Earth, anywhere on the planet. By weight, it will contain roughly two cubic centimeters of thorium metal. So if you could extract all the thorium from a regular piece of dirt anywhere, you'd get about two cubic centimeters of thorium and about half a cubic centimeter of uranium. If you were to consume that thorium at high efficiency, which is the kind of thing you could potentially do in a lifter, it would be as if that cubic meter of Earth had the energy content of 30 cubic meters of crude oil. So this is a remarkable potential capability, the ability to take worthless dirt anywhere in the world and make it worth many multiples of crude oil. I can't think of any industrialist who, if you were to present him with an easily accessible huge pool of crude oil, wouldn't say, yes, <laughs> let me slurp that up and go sell it to somebody and make a lot of money. You know, here's a way to turn worthless dirt into something worth more than that. But the key is to build a machine that has the ability to very efficiently convert thorium into energy. Part of the reason for this is because thorium starts so much lower on the, on the chain of uh, nuclear masses than uranium-235 and uranium-238. When we build an existing reactor, it's mostly uranium-238 fuel and a few percent uranium-235. This is where the fissioning takes place, and uranium-235 will fission about 85% of the time. So about 15% of it will become uranium-236 and then ultimately neptunium-237. But 97% of it is only one neutron absorption away from being, can't really see, that's plutonium-239. So the formation of these transuranics, that's really what drives a lot of the worry about long-lived nuclear waste. We're making plutonium, we're making americium, curium, these, these higher forms. Why don't we make as much in the thorium cycle? Well, the reason is we start down here with thorium-232, which when it absorbs a neutron becomes uranium-233. That'll fission 90% of the time, so only 10% of it makes it to become U-234. It absorbs another neutron and becomes uranium-235, which will fission 85% of the time. So now you're down to about 1.5% of this material could potentially make it to neptunium-237, which is your first transuranic. That then can be physically extracted from the salt, if desired, and you've arrested the formation of further transuranics. Or an alternative would be to retain it in the salt. This is going to lead to some neutron loss and uh, form plutonium-238, which at NASA we are just really, really dying to get our hands on because we use plutonium-238 to explore the solar system. Lifters, if operated in a particular manner, would have the potential to make small quantities of this. In fact, uh, I was at a meeting at NASA with some of my old friends there and, and telling them about this potential, and they got really excited, and they said, can you make, are you just going to make this stuff anyway? And I said, well, no, we have to choose to make it. Uh, it's to our advantage to actually take it out at this stage so as not to make plutonium-238. He goes, oh, darn, you know. I said, but under the right circumstances, and, and if there was a, a national need for this and a national interest, uh, there's the potential there to do this. And, and he got kind of excited because we really are hurting for this. We launched the Curiosity rover to Mars uh, last year, and it's got uh, a large fraction of our remaining plutonium-238 on board. It's going to be able to explore Mars using that material, which is really going to be cool. Getting back to some of the things we can, we can make with a lifter. With existing reactors, we basically we make electricity. That's, that's about all we do. We throw away all the waste heat and we don't use uh, the fission products. With a lifter, on the other hand, we can not only convert to electrical uh, energy at much higher efficiencies, but we can also use the low temperature waste heat for desalinated water. We can alternatively tap off some of the process heat for a potential generation of hydrogen and my favorite product from hydrogen, which is ammonia, because ammonia leads to fertilizer, and fertilizer leads to uh, the green revolution that we've enjoyed as, as uh, inhabitants of this earth for the last few decades. That's why uh, seven billion of us can be fed on this planet when before we could only feed about one billion, is because now we know how to make fertilizer, and that's primarily driven by fossil fuels. And then there's also great value potentially to the separated fission products. This is a slide, I believe I borrowed this from Per Peterson, about how high temperature heat from gas cold reactor, but the same principle applies because of the power conversion system, how high temperature heat can be then converted to electricity, and then the waste heat is used to cool seawater in order to lead to desalinization. So uh, let me talk for about molybdenum for a moment. Uh, molybdenum 99 will decay to technetium 99, and technetium 99 is 
used in more uh, radioisotope procedures worldwide than anything. About 30 million procedures worldwide use technetium-99. Uh, some of these other smaller radioisotopes, iodine-131 also produced in a reactor like this, xenon-133 also produced. Uh, these guys, no, we don't make those. But there's the potential there to make uh, these medical radioisotopes. And then technetium-99 in turn is used in a variety of different diagnostic procedures, uh, primarily related to your heart, how is your heart performing, also your bones, uh, liver, your lungs. It's, it's really a remarkable diagnostic tool. It is combined with a variety of different compounds. These are called cold kits in order to try to ascertain uh, different performance, gallbladder function or kidney scan or blood pool imaging. Each one of these is a compound that the molybdenum is, is connected to in order to do that. Right now, it's made in just a handful of research reactors that are scheduled to be shut down. There's some great papers written about the market failure of not having uh, the money that's being made in, in technetium going back to operating these reactors. So they're going to be shut down. This is the supply chain for one of these reactors. It's in the Netherlands. The molybdenum is produced there. It's uh, extracted. Then it's shipped over to Chicago, right here, into O'Hare. And it's trucked down to Maryland Heights in Missouri to uh, Covidian's Maryland Heights facility where it is, where it is made into uh, what's called generators. And this is what they look like. They've got this little uh, column of silica and they lay the molybdenum on there and then when they take it to the hospital and it is eluded. They run a small saline line through here and they extract the technetium. The technetium comes out in the saline, the molybdenum doesn't. And these run for about a week or two and they treat patients with this. You know, this is a really uh, remarkable process. Unfortunately, the ability to service the world's molybdenum needs is already very limited and it's on its way down, which is, which is bad. For over 50 years, we've been focused on the electricity that can be generated from fission, but about 5% of fission leads to the formation of the uh, molybdenum 99, the 99 mass decay chain. And it could be that this is potentially worth even more than electricity. What's unique about Lifter is that we can extract this valuable product while making electrical power. We can do both at the same time. Our power reactors today, they make lots and lots of molybdenum, but it's not extractable. If you want to get it out, you'd have to shut the reactor down, depressurize it, cool it, extract the fuel, reprocess it. By the time you did that, the molybdenum's all gone. It's only got a 66-hour half-life, so you can't do it fast enough. And then these little research reactors where they do make the molybdenum, they have to use targets, and there's a lot of issues surrounding the use of targets. Here's a way where we can do both at the same time. We can make electrical power, and we can make this useful uh, medical isotope. I'm going to talk about another one that's somewhat related to thorium and uranium, and that is uh, the idea of targeted alpha therapy. Targeted alpha therapy is when you take an antibody and you attach a, an alpha emitting radioisotope. And the one they're showing here is bismuth 213, which is probably the most promising. The notion is the antibody then goes in the body, it attaches to whatever you want to target, typically a cancer cell, but maybe other things. And then when the bismuth decays, it gives this knockout punch to the cancer cell and kills it. And so this is an exciting technique, and there's lots and lots of alpha-emitting radioisotopes. There's uh, four decay chains, three of which occur naturally. The thorium, uranium, and actinium decay chains occur naturally. So you look at this and you think, there's got to be a good alpha emitter. There's got to be lots of good alpha emitters. Well, turns out there's not. Um, bismuth-213, which is the favored one, exists on a decay chain that no longer exists in nature, the neptunium decay chain. We, in the course of pursuing a thorium-powered world, recreated this decay chain about 50 years ago. And we have an inventory of uranium-233 that has led to the formation of the precursors of bismuth-213. It's sitting up at Oak Ridge right now. It's slated for destruction. Many of you know about this and have tried to help fight against the destruction of that material. But on the other decay chains, there's not a lot of uh, promising alternatives. Bismuth-212, uh, this is on the same decay chain as thallium-208, which is a hard gamma emitter. Many of us in the thorium world are familiar with uh, one of the ancestors, uranium-232, that can lead to these hard gamma emissions. So putting this stuff in the body is not a really great idea either. And then over here on this decay chain, they have to make acetine-211 in a particle accelerator. That limits how much you can make. So really, it turns out that this neptunium decay chain is unique. Now, golly, wouldn't it be great if there was this stuff on Earth and lots and lots of it and, and we could just go 
mine it, and we can't because it, it, it went extinct a long time ago. It's the only one of the four decay chains that doesn't pass through radon on the way through its decay. And that's significant because all the other decay chains, as they pass through radon, radon's a gas. And as you go through radon, your stuff gets away. It gets out of whatever you've got it in, usually a liquid, and so it's hard to retain. And so not passing through a radon step is very, very significant to starting out with a parent material and getting to this bismuth-213, which can be a real cancer killer. We need to get this stuff in the hands of doctors so that they can use it to treat deadly diseases like acute myeloid leukemia and other cancers. If we had this material extracted from this parent source, I really think it would lead to a revolution in fighting cancer. And we've talked about political challenges and situations. This is yet another one that's got a real political challenge situation attached to it. Okay, so all these great benefits, how do we know this can work? Uh, quite simply, because, because we did it. Back at Oak Ridge in the 1950s and 1960s, we built two reactors, the aircraft reactor experiment and the molten salt reactor experiment. I had the great pleasure uh, the last couple of days to talk with some of the pioneers of the molten salt reactor program. And that was one of the things they kept emphasizing to me in my discussions with them. We really did this. We were trying to prove feasibility. We felt like we proved that feasibility, but it was a, it was a pyrrhic victory because there were the forces of the Atomic Energy Commission, despite the success of the molten salt reactor program, were very focused on building plutonium fast breeder reactors. That was really the sole focus. At the, at the decision point, at the time when, when we needed to decide whether we were going to go forward with this technology, uh, the entire focus of the AEC was, was on the plutonium fast breeder. And so it was set aside. Now, when the plutonium fast breeder program foundered in the late 70s, to the best of my knowledge, nobody went back and revisited that decision. Nobody went back and asked, you know, should we have gone the other way? Should we have, uh, should we have used thorium? I wish, that, I wish that question had been asked because maybe we would be having a very different conversation today if in the early 80s people had said, let's go back and, and revisit that. We could have taken advantage of existing uh, understanding the, the, the men and women who were working on this and making it happen. Well, nevertheless, that's where we are. Here we are today in a world that desperately needs more energy at lower prices with a far lower impact on the environment. And how are we going to do that? Well, I remain convinced that thorium is the answer. And I, I've come to this belief because of learning about the technology of the liquid-fueled reactor and the potential to have a tremendous amount of energy that would quite literally be able to be held in the palm of your hand and, and would cost a few cents. And, and uh, Jim would probably challenge that and tell me it would cost nothing, right, Jim? <laughs> I, I, I got curious, how much thorium would it take to power all of North America for a year? And, and uh, it would uh, quite easily fit in this grain silo, of which I passed many on my drive up here from Alabama yesterday. So the good news is we've already got uh, four grain silos worth of thorium sitting out in a hole in Nevada. So it's not as if thorium is going to uh, be something that somebody's going to uh, go and corner the market on. I, I'm often asked that question, uh, is, is somebody going to get the drop on us on this? And I say, I don't think it's going to happen with regards to thorium supply. I think it's much more likely to happen with regards to the technology to make that thorium worth something, you know, worth more than zero, which is basically where we are right now. This is a cartoon. This is a, a notion of, of what we're, what we're uh, striving towards. This is kind of an aspirational goal of what we're striving towards at Flybe Energy with a small and uh, minimally invasive thorium reactor installation. So the reactor, this would be the outer uh, containment structure of the reactor. Inside would be the reactor vessel, the drain tanks, the primary heat exchangers, and the pumps. And what would be exiting the reactor you see here would be the coolant salt, the, the bare fly or, or fly knack or whatever we decide to use for the coolant salt. It's just carrying the heat from the nuclear reaction out to gas turbines. The idea of saying, let's go and be able to put in case a, a silo underground, fill it with water, both for radiation shielding and for seismic isolation, and then go and place the reactor in it and connect it to uh, gas turbines above grade. So this is, this is kind of the, the idea of what our design is striving towards. We're focused, as many of you know, on trying to provide electrical energy for our military facilities here in the United States. In Alabama last year, we suffered some really, really awful tornadoes, and our base, Redstone Arsenal, was off the grid for a week and a half. That's left an indelible impression in the minds of our leadership there and also in the minds of the community, that that's not acceptable. We need to have uh, 
an energy solution that gives us what's called secure redundancy. And so people get it. As we've as we talked to civic leaders, as we've talked to the community, they're getting it. They agree that something like this needs to be done. And they're excited that uh, we're in Huntsville, uh, Rocket City, USA, a, a city that, that put men on the moon a long time ago. And, and I've told my wife for many years, Huntsville's been looking for its second act for a long time. And there's a lot of great talent there. Uh, a lot of people at the Army, at NASA, and industry. Uh, we have one of the second largest research parks in the entire United States. We've got a tremendously educated workforce. It's a great place to live. Uh, come down and you'll probably see why we're so excited about Huntsville, Alabama, why we think it's the right place to, to move forward on this. What is our opportunity with, with thorium and the, and the liquid fluoride reactor? Uh, trivial fuel cost. That's actually not the biggest deal because fuel cost is still pretty low right now for existing reactors. No carbon dioxide emissions, very attractive uh, in, our, in our carbon intense world. Very high availability factor. That is a very distinguishing thing versus other low or zero carbon sources. And the potential to be much simpler and safer than conventional uranium fueled reactors that operate at high pressure. And with the two fluid design, we also have the potential to be scalable, to go up and go down. I was talking with one of the gentlemen that was on the molten salt reactor program. I was asking why the one fluid design they went to. I said, what about the scalability? He said, well, we weren't even thinking about scalable. We were thinking about 1,000 megawatt units. I said, I said, well, we're thinking about a 40 megawatt unit. He goes, oh, well, that size, yeah, that's probably not going to be a real good idea. You're going you're gonna to want to take a different approach. So again, with the two fluid, we have the potential for some great scaling. We have political pressure to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We obviously have economic pressure to reduce the cost of energy. Most of the world considers these two pressures to be completely at odds with one another. And, and who's going to give? You know, what's more important, the environment or economic growth? You know, different nations are making different decisions. Wouldn't it be good if we could have both? And the public pressure to address concerns of current nuclear power. This has really increased since Fukushima, fanned by the, by, unfortunately, by the, by the uh, the poor way it has been described in the media. But there is definitely a public pressure there and the military pressure to generate power reliably in remote locations as well as the aspect of secure redundancy which is needed on bases in the United States. I think all of these point to Lifter as a global energy solution. Well, why go now? Why not wait a generation or as a, a lot of people think, they think technology develops without pushing on it. Um, you know, why not wait? Well, there's a lot of proposals for small modular reactors right now, but as Rick said, it's, it's the same old uh, here again. And, and I look at these SMRs that are being proposed, and I go, there's not a lot of new here. This is, this is pretty much a, an existing reactor packaged in a new smaller form. Uh, only lifters will be able to manufacture the radioisotopes, desalinated water, and electrical power simultaneously. You're not going to have to pick from one or the other. You're going to be able to do them all at the same time. I really think that the aftermath of Fukushima will be that a lot of conventional reactors are going to be canceled and delayed. Um, and, and the real, very real risk is that some societies will reject nuclear power altogether. We're seeing this already. We're seeing it in Japan. We're seeing it in Germany. We're seeing it in Italy, where it's just like, no, I'm not going to do it. And, and is that happening because they're just completely radiophobic? Is, or is it happening because they don't know about a better alternative? Uh, I hope there is an alter that we can put an alternative in front of them and make them go, oh, wait, you know, maybe, maybe we're being a little hasty. Maybe we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, I think that revenues from medical sales of radioisotopes are going to be what gets this, this operation out the gate initially rather than electricity. Electricity is still pretty cheap, uh, but these medical radioisotopes are extremely valuable, and I think that's going to fund the global expansion of, of energy from thorium. And, and finally, uh, this is a belief I have. I think thorium will become the world's dominant energy source and that this is the most important development of this century. You know, we're still at the beginning of this century. There's a lot of, a lot of things still going to happen, but I really think that by the time we get to the end, thorium will be the dominant energy source. And I want to leave you with a quote that I love from Alvin Weinberg. During my life, I've witnessed extraordinary feats of human ingenuity. I believe that this struggling ingenuity will be equal to the task of creating the second nuclear era. My only regret is I will not be here to witness its success. Thank you very much.